All right, let's continue. We're on chapter four, page 29. And uh, this chapter is labeled simply as 1954. I swear to the Madonna, the day I blow up my 21 candles, I am out of here for good. I pushed my untouched plate away and stood. In four years, you'll see the back of me. I'll be an adult, and you won't be able to stop me. My voice came out in one hysterical scream. I hate you all. My mother's eyes were desolate. My crimson-faced father tried to contain his rage, while Vittorio glared at me. My younger brother stared at me open-mouthed, Luca's eyes brimmed with tears, and I hated myself for making him sad. Florinda grabbed hold of Nino's hand and squeezed it tight, while little Fortunato burst out crying. Go to your room at once! My father's voice bellowed in the room, and he clenched his fist tight enough to whiten his knuckles. I headed upstairs to the comfort of my room, stamping on every stone step to the first floor. I was no longer a child, and I refused to hang on my parents' words, not if I reckoned I was right. At the top of the stairs, Papa mentioned my name to Vittorio, bringing me to a halt. I wanted to know what was going on. Fuming inside, I crouched on the top step, trying to calm my heavy breathing. I want you to keep a close, closer eye on Bianca. She doesn't seem herself at the moment. Her continual outbursts are raking my nerves. Again, my father giving more responsibilities to Vittorio. I could do without that. Don't worry, Papa. I'll shadow her every move. And go gently with her. You know what she's like. If you show any force, she'll retaliate. Patience will pay off in the end. Yes, Papa. I imagined Vittorio saluting like a good soldier taking orders from the general. No doubt a smug grin on his face. One I'd love to slap off. Swearing under my breath, I jumped to my feet. I'd only picked up a few sentences, but it was enough. Enough to show what was in store for me. I hurried down the corridor and slammed my bedroom door shut. With both hands pressed on my forehead, I leaned back against the door, breathing down my rage. They were suffocating me, breaking me to fit into their mold. I marched to the other side of the room and opened the balcony windows to let in the cool October evening breeze. My favorite month. Vendem Vendemia. Yep, Vendemia time. Although I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. Vendemia. <laughs> when all the folks of the village picked the ripe grapes to make wine. I would no doubt be punished for my outburst and wouldn't be allowed to help out this year. Leaving the window open, I swished the net curtains across to keep the Zen's air out. Even at this time of the year, the hungry mosquitoes still like to bite. Damned horrors. I collapsed onto my bed, gazed at my school bag. Three years had passed since I'd been forced to leave school. How I longed to go back and take a different path. I might have made a good interpreter. French had been one of my favorite subjects. Instead, I'd settled down to the routine of my parents had set out for me. Apart from sewing and embroidering, there was a stack of household chores to deal with, not to mention the important task of looking after the chickens. What responsibility? That said, I tried to look at the positive side of things. Mama had taught me all she knew about embroidery, and being gifted with my hands, a renowned dressmaker in Fuscoli had agreed to train me. 
in a way, I considered myself lucky. At least I got to walk to her house every day with Anna. The six kilometers took us about an hour, and we could talk without being spied on. Not a lot of freedom, but with Vittorio out of the way and busy studying in school, it was heaven. And to top it all, to top it all, my father came for us in the evening. At least Papa didn't pull my hair or bully me. He always walked a few meters behind us, scanning the surroundings in case a boy plucked up enough courage to talk to us. Not that anyone would have dared. They knew Don Domenico. No point in poking at the bear. I sat upright with the sudden urge to sketch. Something about the evening light pushed me to create. Picking up my pad and colored pencils from the bedside table, I stepped out onto the balcony and began sketching. My crayons dressed the page with vivid tones, capturing the exact mood of the sunset. Later, I'd find different strips of material to bring the dress to life. The finished result flashed in my mind, and my heart pounded, convinced the creation would please my mentor. Quick break in the story. Hi, Jazz. Dawn had yet to break. I blinked open my eyes and let them slowly adjust to the dim morning light. Silence enveloped the room, apart from the sound of Florinda's slow breathing and a few birds chirping on the rooftops. After a few minutes, the steady patter of rain tapped against the window. It brought a soothing calm, despite my worry for the day ahead. Slipping my legs over the side of the bed, I crept over to my chair and grabbed my clothes. I made a trip to the bathroom and prepared myself there. Safe in the room, I took in slow, deep breaths. Was I really ready for today? Ready for the stepping stone of my future? For my diploma? The diploma I'd been working for relentlessly over the past three years could be mine at the end of the day. If I managed to pass, I'd be one step nearer to the goal of getting away. I dreaded to think what would happen if I failed. I dressed with care in my forest green cotton robe with a white embroidered collar. I'd made the dress and embroidered the collar myself, one of my creations, but that gained me extra points. The warm smell of panettone greeted me in the kitchen. Mama had always been an early riser. She said it was the only time of the day when she had a bit of time for herself. She turned to me, and a shaft of light beamed through the window, bathing her beautiful face with soft glow. My father looked up from his paper and greeted me with a weak smile. He said he would accompany me to the examination building at Saleta. All well, Clara, Cara? My mother asked. Was I all right? A mixture of nausea and excitement hit my stomach, and the fresh smell of cake didn't help. What I'd give to run back to bed and crawl into a tight ball. Panetton and coffee? I shook my head. My stomach shifted again and I hugged myself. My mother chuckled, wrapped a piece of cake in a cloth, and handed it to me. If you don't want anything to eat, at least take this with you for later. I held out a shaky hand and took the cake. Not that I'd eat it. You'll be fine, my father said, folding his paper. Let's go. I took in a deep breath and stood. Yes, let's go. Grabbing my bag with my sewing equipment, I slid the cake into one of the pockets and followed my father into the piazza. Today could make the difference between walking into my future with flying colors or biting the dust with all the other candidates who failed the exam. Outside, the sun had barely risen. I pulled my jacket tighter around me and slipped my hand into the crook of my father's arm. Although it had ceased raining half an hour earlier, drops still fell from the trees, accentuating the silence. 
A chilly mist crouched in the shadows of the houses, clinging to the water fallen onto the pavement. We headed down the street, both in our own thoughts. It didn't look as if Papa wanted to talk about my outburst of the night before, and I certainly wouldn't bring up the subject. This was one of the problems in our family. No one talked about anything. Unpleasant subjects were forgotten. No one said they were sorry. Life went on, as if nothing had happened. In a way, it wasn't a bad thing. No one wanted to break up the past. We were all eager to forget. On the other hand, it would have been nice from time to time to talk about things calmly, to clear the air. I paced across the examination room to the table I'd work from. The overheated room caused my fingers to swell, not what I needed. Clammy hands stuck to the fine paper and left damp marks. Papa had walked me right up to the front door. Typical. Did he assume I'd get kidnapped on the six-meter stretch from the gate? Whatever. He'd grunted a curt goodbye and told me he'd wait at the cafe on the other side of the street. Knowing him, he'd probably drink dozens of coffees, chat with his friends, and inspect his watch every couple of minutes. I scanned the room and recognized two of the other girls. Anna paced up and down in the far corner. I nodded in her direction, and she returned a wink. There were eight of us taking the exam. Eight nervous students. How many of us would pass? Some were bound to fail. There hadn't been one session in the past where everyone had left with a diploma. I prayed one of the failures wouldn't be me. Special dressmaking paper and tools covered each large table. I brought my own scissors. My teacher had told me to use my personal scissors and never, ever share with others. I eyed up the cardboard dressmaker dummy perched next to my table before pulling my stowing stuff out of my shoulder bag and placing them carefully to one side. Four women made up the jury. One of them stood and read out the instructions. We had to make a dress from paper, our own creation, something that would catch the buyer's eye in expensive boutiques. I was determined to make something spectacular. Flashes of silks and flimsy dresses whirled around in my head. My mind had already stepped into creative mode and my trainer's words came to mind. You don't follow fashion. You make fashion. We were given the signal to start, and I lost myself in my artistic world. Adrenaline throwed, flowed through my veins as my hand reached for the scissors. In my mind, the finished dress would be long and loose. I even imagined the color. For the next hours, all noise around me disappeared. I blocked out the other girls and concentrated solely on my mission. Though being a dressmaker hadn't been my wish when I was forced to leave school, I enjoyed it, especially the design part. My mind was set on going far. Determination pushed me to go further. What I'd give to join a team of designers in a renowned fashion house or even start my own company. Achieve something with my life. I needed this diploma. After four hours of chalking, cutting, and sewing, I stood back, hands on hips, and admired the attire of the dummy. Warmth spread through my body and my chest became lighter all of a sudden. My stomach grumbled, which was a good sign. I smiled, in smiled inwardly and risked a glimpse at the other candidates, especially the one to my right. Once or twice she'd peeked at my work. Her creation wasn't bad. It had a certain style to it, but was nothing exceptional. The sleeves pulled too much at the paper around the dummy's bust, meaning she'd gotten the pattern wrong from the start. It wouldn't get her a diploma. That much I was sure of. 
My design was different. It had only one strap over the left shoulder. I'd folded tight pleats around the waist, and the rest of the paper twirled around into shocks of midnight blue. Exactly the color in my mind. The hem fell above the knees. Very darling. A reflection of my mood today. When the time was up, we all stood back and waited for the jury to examine our masterpieces. The women took their time, whispering to one another and making notes in their tiny books, all while keeping their poker faces. They spent a lot of time examining the other dummies. Mine got a quick look over, no more. The ladies returned to the front of the room and began writing down names on diplomas. Concentrated on how many they were drawing up. Three. Not a good sign. Five of us were going to be disappointed. With hands clasped behind my back and my fingers crossed, I waited for my name to be called. The collar of my dress strangled me. I tugged at the neckline, and my breathing grew shallow and rapid. Shit. Didn't want to pass out. Bianca Rambardi. My heart, rate, my heart rate picked up even more, and I grinned like a fool. On wobbly legs, I walked up to them and shook the hand of an administrator before grabbing my ticket to freedom. The diploma that would remind me I'd accomplish something. I wanted to run, jump, and scream at the same time. A piece of paper sticking to my clammy hands was my future. Yesterday was already history. Today was on its way out. Tomorrow was the destiny I'd been waiting for. Yet, it didn't stop me from being scared. I could now carry on my apprenticeship in Naples. Stay with three sisters. Les Sorel, as we called them. I'd finally be out of my brother's grip. The seamstress had promised to take me on if I got my diploma. But that meant four months of apprenticeship. Four months away from home. I would only return home once training, once the training period finished. I raised my eyes to the ceiling and mumbled a silent prayer. Honor rushed up to me and hugged me in her arms. We've done it, Bianca. She whispered before pulling back and waving her certificate under my nose. Oh my god. We've done it. I gathered my belongings, all the while thinking of Papa. He'd agreed that I could attend the small dressmaking boarding school in Naples, and I hoped he'd stick to his promise. He'd already done some investigating, and was satisfied that the three sisters who ran the school came from a good background and would keep a close eye on me. I dashed out of the building and across the road. Papa was waiting in front of the cafe and I dived into his arms. Brava, Bianca. With my head against his chest, I closed my eyes and breathed in his tobacco-scented shirt. Deep down, he wasn't a bad man. In his dreams, he had big plans for his family. Dreams that might never come true or could turn into nightmares. Maybe he'd set the hurdles too high. For years, he'd cared for me when Mama was too busy looking after my younger brothers. We had a strong bond, a profound understanding. At what point had that stopped? When he'd started making decisions I didn't agree with? He'd always decided for the family, though. Maybe I was too independent. My mouth dropped open when my gaze fell on Vittorio standing in a back street. Surely he shouldn't be hanging around with girls. Papa, re Papa already had a person in mind for him. One of his friend's daughters. If I told on my brother, I'd be out of his firing line for a while. And what pleasure would that bring? On the other hand, Vittorio might make my life hell even more so than now. I said nothing. 
Best not to tempt the devil. Didn't stop me from flinching, though. Papa was no fool. He'd sensed my unease. In one swift move, he turned to where Vittorio stood chatting to a girl. One, had shoved, one hand shoved deep into his trouser pocket, the other pushing a strand of the girl's hair behind her ear. This was the first time my brother had shown signs of affection to anyone. Was his nastiness a special gift for his sisters? I closed my gaping mouth. What other hidden facets did he have? Come on. My father's gruff voice brought me out of my daydreaming, his face crimson with suppressed rage. Let's go. Took my hand and placed it in the crook of his arm, all the while grinding his teeth. Tapped my fingers with every determined stride he took, making it difficult to keep in step with him. From time to time, I glanced his way, but remained silent. Not a lot to say. One thing was for sure, Vittorio would be summoned. It served him right. I'd often overheard, I had often overheard Papa talking with friends in the piazza, arguing about who would be best match for their children, as well as negotiating land and dowries. That said, most of the offspring were in the marrying age range. All the men wanted the best for their families, or what they thought was the best for their children. Papa would choose partners for each of us. Vittorio was no exception. We arrived home at one o'clock. Mama waited for our return, and so did my younger brothers. Florinda was at work and at the dressmaker's boutique, and Vittorio... Well, apparently Vittorio was chasing a girl. I pulled my diploma out of my bag and rushed into my mother's arms. Brava, Bianca, she whispered into my ear, and I swallowed the lump in my throat. My brothers bounced up and down on their seats, shouting and cheering. They were even happier than me. Bless it, my father said, washing his hands at the kitchen sink. He was in a mood. I reckoned because he'd spotted Vittorio in the streets with a local girl. My father had high hopes for his son to marry into a good family, and Papa expected everyone to obey him, even his beloved son. Hey. I woke the next morning to the sound of the solitary whistle from a blackbird breaking the morning hush. That usually put me in a good mood. Today, for no reason, I got up heavy-hearted. Determined to not let my bad mood get the better of me, I swished back the net curtains and breathed in the fresh air. Warm breeze teased my hair. Early morning was the best time of day. It overflowed with sweetness and quietness. You woke me up. I didn't finish my lovely dream. Lorinda pulled her pillow over her head and moaned into the mattress. I rolled my eyes and left the room. If Lorinda wanted delays in bed, fine. I'd promise Mama to clean the windows. Half an hour later, after a big breakfast, I buried my bad mood at the back of my mind and began to wash the panes of glass with a damp cloth. Ideas swirled in my mind. The ones that always popped up were... Ways of attaining a better future. Something to be proud of. Deep in my dream world, I didn't hear Luca enter the room until he collapsed onto the bed and made the springs creak. He rolled onto his stomach, and with his elbows dug into the mattress, rested his chin on his hands. Sing for me, Bianca. You always sing when you clean the windows. I began to hum and a joyful melody filled the air. My mood brightened, as always when I sang. My voice warmed up, and, my, and the singing became clearer and more powerful until it filled the room. All activity in the piazza stopped. Always did. When folk heard me sing, they'd come to stand below the balcony to catch every note. Through the glass panes, I saw their faces light up. The last high note left my throat, 
warbling until it died a sudden death, leaving me breathless. Brava! I spun around to see my aunt in the doorway. Zia, when did you arrive? I rushed into her arms and she hugged me close, her flimsy floral dress cool against my body. You've got an incredible voice, my child. As if to emphasize my aunt's words, the room buzzed with cheering and loud clapping. My audience in the piazza agreed. We all know that, Luca said, jumping up from the bed. He welcomed his aunt with a brief kiss before heading out of the room. I promise to look at the Fortunato, he shouted over his shoulder. See you later. Zia Maria kissed the top of my head, and childhood memories swarmed to mind. All the holidays spent together in her mountain home, and the weekends relaxing in her villa at the beach. I loved this special aunt. She considered me as a grown-up. Some people found her eccentric because of the way she dressed, too bright for their liking. That didn't bother me. She brought a breath of sunshine into my life. Unlike my parents, Zia never belittled my feelings and treated me as an adult rather than a difficult child. With no children of her own, I'd become her substitute daughter. A daughter she'd helped progress in life. A child who was loved and respected. In a nutshell, she'd become the listening ear and encouragement I lacked at home. Hard knocking on the front door brought me back to the present before loud voices echoed in the hallway. One of the voices was Papa's. The other I didn't recognize. Let's go down, I said, grabbing my aunt's hand. She nodded and we skipped down the stairs. A middle-aged man in a smart tuxedo stood in conversation with Papa. The two men faced each other like boxers in a fighting ring. My father, with feet apart and arms folded, high across his chest. The stranger appeared more relaxed, confident even, bearing a sort of self-respecting pride. No doubt due to his attire, which didn't go unnoticed. Only rich, important people wore suits like that. Like I said, the stranger said, dabbing his brow with a red and white striped handkerchief. I heard someone singing and I'd like to meet her. What an incredible voice. Thought it was the radio at first. I squeezed Zia's hand and returned the, and she returned the pressure. Papa only snorted, not impressed by the man's compliments. Oh, she could go far. Naples is the place to be for opera singers. Imagine her on the stage in the San Carlos Theater. My heart picked up a quicker tempo. Is this the start of a new life? My name in lights outside Italy's best opera house? After Napoli, why not Milano, Verona, or even Venezia? My father held up a hand. My daughter is only 17 and she's going nowhere. Papa pulled the door open, letting a breeze of warm air enter. I know how young, vulnerable girls get to the top. Now goodbye. The stranger's face fell into a frown. He had no doubt believed my father would jump at the chance. How little he knew Papa. If you change your mind, contact me here, he said, placing a white business card on the window's ledge. My father ignored it. I won't change my mind. Goodbye. The sound of the stranger's shoes on the pavement rang in the now deserted square. My father closed the door and ripped up the card. Why do you always have to spoil everything for everybody? Zia Maria shouted. I would have gone with her. You know I have a house in Nipples. Papa waved her away. Even his sister couldn't make him see reason. And my world fell apart. This might have been the opportunity to get away and live a different life. Zia would have been my chaperone. 
things would have been perfect. Tears threatened to fall, but I blinked them back. Stupid me for believing my father would agree. Once again, my happiness had been short-lived. With my, hell, my head held high, I rushed out of the house and headed down the back alleyway. I simply needed to take off. Around the corner, I came face to face with Vittorio talking with Thorinda. So much for trying to get away. He wouldn't let me take a step further. That I was sure of. You look strange. Are you alright? Vittorio said, coming to stand in front of me. Where had his concern come from? He couldn't care less. Well? I shrugged and took a step back. What's up, Vittorio? He took me gently by the hand and folded it into the crook of his arm, while Florinda followed behind. Why do you always assume I'm out to trap you? He asked. I tugged my arm free. I'm just surprised you're being so nice to me. He threw his head back and laughed, like the madman he was. And Mama's words came to mind. Quando il divialo ti accresa. <laughs> Again, me trying to sound Italian and speak Italian at the same time. Let me try the whole thing again. Quando il divalo ti accresa o nova la ninama. La anima. La. Words. Italian words. Insert here. When the devil's nice to you, he's after your soul. Is what it translates to. I'm worried about you, Bianca. You're too quiet lately. Not like you at all. You're doing fine? Thank you, Jess. His words appear to be those of a caring brother, but the tone he used was anything but friendly. He was going on in that warp. What was going on in that warped mind of his? We hadn't quarreled recently because I'd been keeping out of his way. I had my future to sort out. Too much on my mind to think of Vittorio. I'm fine, I replied. Vittorio raised an eyebrow, and his mouth crept into a grin. He didn't look in the least bit convinced. Get in the house. Don't tell me what to do. Anger still swirled in my veins from my earlier disappointment. Vittorio faced me, fists clenched. Florinda pulled on my arm. Do as he says, Bianca. I wrenched my arm free. Stop being such a wimp. Aren't you fed up of being a doormat? I just don't want any trouble. And I don't want to be told what to do. Especially not by him, I said, raising my chin in defiance. Why can't you whisper? Vittorio asked, shoving me against the wall. Because you give me a, really, a million reasons to shout, that's why. My outburst was rewarded with a mighty slap that sent my head spinning and cheekbone drumming. I screamed out in pain, only to receive another. Tears of rage burned my eyes. I opened my mouth to speak. The words died in my throat when I met my brother's gaze. If looks could kill, I'd be dead and buried by now. Best not to tempt the devil further. Instead, I rubbed my cheek, headed up the alleyway to the house. Lorinda followed like a dog treading on the heels of her master. At least she hadn't stayed with the demon. I'm not putting up with any more of this, I whispered when she caught up with me. Be careful, Bianca. Vittorio can be real mean. I gazed into her wide eyes and caught fright embedded there. Lorinda only wanted to help. Keep the peace. She was ready to give in rather than to cause problems. 
Are you happy with your life? I asked her. What do you mean? Not allowed to do this or that. Never free to go out alone. Doesn't that bother you, Florinda? My sister shrugged. That's our life, Bianca. And we have to accept it. You are joking, aren't you? Blow me off if you think I'm going to abide by our dearest brother's rules. You'll get into trouble. I chewed my thumbnail and I hit the and I hit the quick. Shit. That hurt. My sister put her hand on my arm. Stop it, Bianca. I know that look. Don't do anything foolish. It's not worth it. Lorinda knew me too well. Knew that I wouldn't put up with injustice. I dashed up to the stairs to our bedroom, calculating my next plan of action. Mm, daddy. I'd have my revenge yet. A chuckle sounded in the back of my throat, and this time one of my father's sayings sprang to mind. He who laughs last, laughs loudest. And I had one hell of a strong laugh. 